All right, guys, welcome to week two. Uh, this week we're talking about Snicker, simple non-interactive coin drawing with keys for encryption reused. Um, I'm going to allow myself 15 minutes to go through the paper like we did last week, and then we'll open it to discussion. Uh, we're very lucky that Adam Gibson, the author of this uh, this BIP proposal, is here, so he's going to answer questions and um, correct what anything that I've said that might be wrong. Okay, um, so this is where you can find... Uh, more about this. Uh, we're, we're taking it from GitHub, so the link is here. Um, the PowerPoint will be uploaded somewhere. I'll make sure that happens. Uh, okay. Um, last week, just a quick reminder, we did an AppSec coin join, and our summary was that we can mix with arbitrary values if we do a tactical uh, partition of outputs, uh, breaking them down further to make more possible uh, interpretations of a coin join transaction. Uh, so last week was Knapsack, this week is Snicker, next week we will discuss at the end of this video, um, and you can always find out what we're doing at the Wasabi Research Club link. Okay, so what's the problem that's being addressed with current coin joins? Uh, uh, the entire concept around Snicker, if I understand it correctly, is that we're trying to deal with the fact that coin joins are interactive. If you're familiar with how Wasabi or Join Market or any coin join uh, system works, you have all these participants that need to coordinate together. Um, typically, this coordination requires a coordinator, uh, and even if the coordinator takes special precautions to use, you know, blind signatures and Tor and all these things, there's still some amount of privacy that's being leaked because of the coordinator. Uh, it's also very difficult to coordinate. As you know, with Wasabi, if you have 100 participants, there can be all sorts of issues uh, with coordination. And um, the coordination is fragile to attack because now there's a central point of failure. So if someone really wanted to hurt a particular uh, mixing protocol, they could just attack the server uh, that's doing the coordination with a denial of service attack, for example. So this is the question we're going to ask today, which is, could a coin join be done without coordination? So on the right, we see a, a typical coin join that like some, something like Wasabi would do. You have these inputs, you have these outputs, and you have these mixed green outputs that could belong to any of the participants. And when you think about what it means, it fundamentally consists of three things that need to be uh, allocated from every participant, which is an input, an output, and a signature. So those three things we're going to address in this, uh, in this paper. So part one, inputs. So I'm directly now reading from the Snicker version 0 and version 1. So um, uh, how can we figure out an input for a coin join? Well, a proposer uh, in this scheme, because uh, we'll have two people, a proposer and a receiver, uh, they, they obviously know their own input because they're the ones that's interested in, 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 in mixing, but they don't know the input of a potential coin join buddy. Because we're not using coordination, there's no, there's no people that are waiting you know, in, in, in line uh, to do this. So one way we can deal with this is that the proposer simply guesses which UTXO on the blockchain might most likely be interested. So maybe there's 10,000 UTXOs that fit the right uh, um, um, specifications, and, and now this, this uh, proposer that's trying to do an uncoordinated coin join is going to guess which of those might um, be interested in doing a coin join. So maybe the UTXO that they, they look for are ones that are part of a join market transaction or that are uh, just at random, or maybe a, a coin join that comes from a previous <laughs> transaction. Um, you know, later on a sneaker gets more adopted. So here on our left, we have our orange UTXO. We are the proposer in this case, and we're looking out in the world, and we see all of these possible UTXOs that could be our inputs. And really what we're doing is we're just essentially just randomly selecting one that meets the criteria, which is that it's smaller than our uh, UTXO, in this case 21, so 20 works. And what we're doing is we're just constructing the coin join ourselves. So if we're orange, then black is some other person. This is what it's going to look like here. Um, so obviously, we're going to match the value with the value of the UTXO we're selecting, and then we're going to have some change for ourselves. Uh, so, so far, that's what it looks like. And we could continue do doing this over and over again for any number of UTXOs. We simply select a UTXO from a pool, uh, put it on the input side, create the transaction, fill everything in. So that covers inputs. So with inputs, we're just going to guess. With outputs, well, a proposer knows their own address, and they know their own unused addresses, right? So every time we create transactions, we, we use fresh addresses. But how will a proposer figure out a fresh address that belongs to another party that isn't participating in the same transaction, right? This is actually, I think, the, the most interesting and clever part of, of Snicker. So we're, we're going to try to answer this question. So there's... Um, 
there's the question of, you know, when I take this 19, uh, you know, Bitcoin uh, UTXO uh, input um, that I found on the blockchain and I construct this transaction myself, how, how what am I going to fill in for the address of the person that I'm trying to coin? Join with, right? I can't communicate with that person directly. There's no back and forth. This isn't coordinated. Um, so there's an obvious solution, which is just copy the same address used by that UTXO. So if that UTXO is using an address with a public key, um, you know, X, just reuse the same public key. Well, obviously that's not very smart because that it exactly points out to the to the public um, that uh, the uh, the unwinding of the coin join. So that's a very simple uh, working solution, but it's obviously is, it doesn't uh, do anything privacy wise. So there's a smart solution is that we can use an address that is tweaked from the public key of the UTXO by a common shared secret between parties. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, the public key that we know our mystery user has, which is uh, on the left here, uh, the, the input of 19. We're going to take that public key and we're going to tweak it with a common shared secret. Um, and here I think we have to take, um, oh wait, just, yeah. So, uh, so all we know, so all we know about the mystery UTXO is that it possesses the private key to the public key that holds the funds. Um, but it's important to understand in this, in this model that the public key isn't explicitly written in a UTXO. Uh, when you send money to someone, you only uh, make a commitment to the hash of their public key. So uh, what that means is that uh, we can only know a public key to an address if that address has spent funds from it in the past. So th this is where the idea of address reuse comes in. Um, so really we're looking for an, an address that has a coin, that has a UTXO, and an address that's previously spent another UTXO from it, um, um, and thus revealed its public key. So, um, but how will we tweak the public key of the receiver with a shared secret? Um, so this is the, the, the really the, the, the coolest part, and it's, I think it's the only time we need to take a brief aside in terms of math so we're going to just quickly cover some stuff that you can you can not worry about if you don't care um but the way that elliptic curve uh, math works is that uh, uh on our first line here we have some private key p and it's associated with a public key p when run through the elliptic curve with generator point g and a different person's public key uh, a private key might be k and it has a public key of uh, capital k and as it turns out um you can do addition of uh, private keys because private keys are just numbers, a uh, number of times you run through the elliptic curve. Um, and so this allows us to do something really cool, which is called uh, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, where we can essentially, um, uh, if, if two people each have a public key, then they can apply their private key against the other person's public key to create a common shared secret. Um, so that's pretty much the only thing you need to, to know. And... Uh, some people will will uh, know this because it's very uh, basic uh, cryptography. Other people will probably not be able to appreciate it. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, take the receiver's public key and then uh, create a shared secret, uh, Divi Hellman shared secret between um, uh, the pub uh, our public key as a proposer and their public key. And uh, what we end up getting is a point on the elliptic curve, and I believe that. Uh, um, that is then later uh, hashed uh, in, in the specification. But the point is that there's a shared secret. And so now uh, the output that I'm sending the funds to isn't the same address, but rather uh, the same address uh, tweaked such a way that uh, anyone in the outside world has no idea um, that that uh, uh, tweaked address corresponds to the, uh, um, the input address. Only the, the, the two participants know this shared secret between each other. Okay, so so far, um, we have selected a bunch of candidate UTXOs for the inputs, and specifically with uh, reused addresses. Um, then we've created a recipient address with a Diffie-Hellman tweak uh, uh, value C. Um, the last part is what about signatures, right? Because we know that um, when we have a coin join, uh, we need all the participants to sign uh, and validate that everything makes sense. So in this case, what we're going to do is the proposer is going to sign their own input creating a PSBT, a partially signed Bitcoin transaction. And there, they need to make that partially signed Bitcoin transaction available to the receiver. 
And the way that you can do this, it's it's very open to uh, to different ideas. But essentially, it can be a public message board. It could be uh, uh, some public server. It could be directly peer to peer, where um, uh, a partic- uh, the proposer is just you know sending out um, uh, uh, these PSBTs to uh, many many people. Um, and uh, so uh, the, the the idea here is that. Um, you know, we have this input of 21 on the left, and we're taking all these uh, valid UTXOs that might possibly work, and we're creating all of these partially signed Bitcoin transactions uh, where we are signing only our own input. Uh, and then we're, we're essentially propagating these partially signed Bitcoin transactions all around. Um, so we're broadcasting them maybe to a message board, maybe to our peers, however it's, 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 it's done. And hoping that someone picks it up and uh, signs off on the uh, transaction and then themselves broadcasts it to the network, to the Bitcoin network, right? Um, so uh, a receiver can verify the, the contents of the PSBT and validate that the Diffie-Hellman um, uh, tweaked public key uh, matches what they have. Um, the, the receiver can then choose to sign or not sign. Uh, there's an important point to note that it would be not safe to just broadcast these PSBTs without encrypting them because a malicious uh, listener could essentially track down these PSBTs and uh, and record them. And then if any of these PSBTs got signed, they could essentially unwind the, the coin join that's happening. Um, so uh, a simple solution is just encrypt the PSBT against the public key of the other party that you're dealing with. So now all you have is uh, these blobs of encrypted data and essentially a single public key um, that can decrypt it. And very little is revealed about, uh, about what's going on there. So in version zero, uh, the summary is a proposer selects potential UTXOs from reused addresses. Proposer then constructs outputs by tweaking the receiver's public key with a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Then proposes, uh, the, then the proposer broadcasts an encrypted PSBT to, to a public forum or to peers directly, and then receiver can decrypt and sign and broadcast. Um, so uh, some really cool things to observe here. The, the two takeaways of, of what makes this protocol cool is, uh, um, is, is firstly, well, I would say secondly, but, but firstly, that Snicker is a deterministic protocol. Everything is on chain. And if a user is restoring their wallet and their wallet is Snicker compatible, then their wallet should have no problem in figuring out um, the tweaked public keys created from Snicker transactions. Um, so there's no need to store persistent data. This is different than a lightning protocol where uh, data needs to be stored. And if you don't have that data stored somewhere, uh, your, 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 uh, your 24 words is not going to be able to find that data for you. And the most important thing, the whole point of, of the Snicker protocol is that it's non-interactive. So some people don't understand what the word non-interactive means. In this case, what we're saying is that the receiver only participates the very, very last stage having had no prior interactions with the proposer. So um, it's minimally interactive. The minimal you can, the minimum interaction you can have is signing a transaction, and that's what we're talking about here. Um, you know, if you compare with the Wasabi protocol right now, you have many, many interactions where you have people registering their inputs, then you have people uh, um, uh, registering, uh, you know, uh, blinded outputs, and then and then registering their change, and then back and forth and back and forth. Uh, in, in this case, we only have one. Uh, interaction at the very, very end. Um, the proposer is doing a lot of work, for sure, by, by propagating a lot of transactions and by doing a lot of uh, figuring out in terms of guessing uh, addresses and public keys and, and uh, potential UTXOs, um, but the receiver is doing very little here. Um, so Snicker version 1 has a simple addition, which is how can we implement Snicker without requiring address reuse? That is, without requiring the receiver to, res- to reveal their public key. Um, and this is, uh, you know, also quite clever, which is that, well, what if the proposer could just guess the co-ownership of a used addresses and UTXO sitting in unused addresses? So, uh, you know, a, a simple way of saying that is, you know, if you look over here on the right, on the right, uh, we have an output of value 10. And that is a UTXO that we think is Snicker compatible with us. So we're a proposer. We look at output 10. We see that's has a lot of potential, um, but we don't know the public key to that that output. But what we observe is that uh, the transaction where it comes from, 
has one input and two outputs, and it looks like output uh, of value 10 is the change. So what we can say is that input of 19 is also change, is, is also uh, belong to the same owner. Thus, that public key probably is in, uh, that public private key pair is, uh, is the same person who has the public private key pair of the output of 10, which is still unspent. So essentially what we're doing is we're trying to not only uh, randomly guess a valid UTXO that works with us, but also some ancestor that's revealed its public key that we can then use um, um, to create the transaction. So this is what it looks like. Um, I essentially, cre uh, on the right, you know, you have your, your input of 21. I select uh, the output of, of value 10. I create my coin joint transaction and the black uh, output 10 on the very far right uses the public key from input 9, 19, way on the left. So I'm not using uh, the same address, but a, a, a past address um, because that past address has revealed its public key. So Snicker, in summary, is non-interactive coin joins are possible between two participants by leveraging either reused addresses or uh, you know guessing co-ownership and a public board for posting PSBTs or some form of communication. Um, and I think that is it. That's everything. So um, yeah, Adam can jump in with, uh, Adam Gibson can jump in with any thoughts and open it to discussion. Thank you, Aviv. I want to just quickly outline the schedule for today. So first of all, Adam, Adam Gibson, uh, whenever you, you you want to leave just say so and and leave don't feel pressured staying here uh second um i want to very first thing i want to you guys to say questions that only the author can answer so we can get over that and then we can do questions and then we can do discussions on topics and then we can do all oh, new ideas this snicker uh, gave us and finally discuss what the next week's uh, paper should be. So um, <coughs> one, one question, does anyone else have a presentation? <laughs> all right, seems like no one. So first, uh, Aviv's presentation, uh, Adam, what was, what, what's your impression? What do you think? Uh, do you want to correct something? Um, no, I, uh, I want to say uh, it's very clear, uh, really high quality. So congratulations on, on an excellent piece of work there. Um, the uh, I was I was looking for mistakes. <laughs> I, I think there might have been one equation in the only math slide that, went, that was wrong. But we <laughs> it's such a trivial point that I, I won't even mention it. Everything else was absolute. I mean, seriously, you explained it very clearly. Um, I guess you didn't explain every detail, but I think you explain most of what's in the BIP. Um, yeah, no, it was very good. So I think it's more a case of if people here have things coming out of that that they still don't understand and, and, and myself and Aviv or anyone else can try and explain it. <laughs> awesome. Anyone has anything to add to the presentation? <clears throat> All right. <laughs> uh, Adam, don't forget to mute yourself sometimes. <laughs> Anyway, Sorry, yeah, I'm just having uh, a stretch. Here, yeah. Okay, how about uh, questions to the author that only the author can answer? I, I mean, in, in general, I think when I first uh, got to know Snickers, I, I thought it was just for entrance reviews, but especially we're reading the bit now. Um, this is especially powerful, for example, with change analysis. Right? So if we have a, a, a coin that's being spent, then the public key is revealed. Right? And in most transactions, the change coin uh, uh, will be with the, from the same owner than the input. Right? So just by having a single, uh, regular spending transaction, Adam, how likely do you think is it that, that we can find a successful uh, proposal uh, for a Snickers, uh, you know, if, if we do change heuristics and other stuff? Yeah, so a couple of points on that. The first point is uh, there's a kind of ironic beauty in this, <laughs> this uh, scenario, which is that specifically 
in the case where there is bad UTXO privacy management, that is the case where this is possible, right? <laughs> because um, if you know which is the change, then you know which one is right, and you can do a coin join, stick a coin join coming out of it. But that's a kind of a quip and a joke, but the more serious point is um, is that it, just, it doesn't really matter. I mean, think of it this way. A, a typical transaction has... Uh, a spending output and a change output. And that's kind of also somewhat true with coin joins where you just have multiple people together and you still have like one out and one chain, one coin join out and one change out. And, you know, if you don't know, let's say in a typical spending transaction, which one's the spend and which one's the change, then you can just make a proposal for both. It's not a big deal. I mean, you, this will naturally lead on to the more, the more important practical question of, you know, how do we handle lots of proposals? But, um, I don't think at first it seems like an important question, but if you think about it, it kind of isn't right. This is very opportunistic. Yeah, that's what I think. So two of them naive coin joins, if they are, if if they are not recognized that they are sneaker coin joins, then they look like normal transactions. So, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, um, that's that's kind of a different point, isn't it? Which is. There's there's this question that Aviv correctly like handled in the presentation, which is like, how do you identify candidates for this process? Um, if you're trying to kind of bootstrap or seed the process, then you might want to be taking, uh, you might want to be proposing coin joins on UTXOs, which are not themselves coin join UTXOs. So they could be ordinary wallet spending transactions. That's a bit tricky, but if, no, if you're going to try... Really. Well, all right, but if you're going to try and do it, obviously you have the fundamental issue of you know which one is the change because I need to know if I'm going to use Snicker version one, then I need to know which one is the change so that I can map it to the input of the transaction and get a public key. So if you're going to do that, then you just might have to try twice instead of once because a typical spending transaction only has two outputs, right? It doesn't have like a hundred. If you're talking about a coin join transaction and you're taking UTXOs from that, then it's a different story, right? But generally speaking. That's going to be somewhat easier. And then the kind of third case is if it's if you want to build a Snicker transaction from a previous Snicker transaction, and that again, like the coin join case, is easy because it's very easy to analyze that transaction in terms of which one is the change, right? Mm -hmm. uh, any more question for the author? I, I have uh, uh, a few, uh, but if anyone else wants to interrupt me, feel free. Um, one thing I would like to ask is um, how you see things going forward with this. So, you know, you have proposers that are scanning the the, the blockchain. Ideally, you would you would have um, wallets that are sneaker compliant. Mm -hmm. that yeah. And and, uh, and so they would um, they would connect to this like uh, message board or, or repository of. Uh, 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 Snicker PSBTs, mm -hmm. encrypted proposals. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to talk a bit about um, incentives? Because I don't know if you said anything about that in the paper. But how do you see incentives playing out in terms of people profiting off of these uh, transactions? Yeah, I um, I did. I didn't talk about it much, but I did briefly mention it, I think, in the uh, future improvement section. I was just sort of waffling a little bit about, you know, under what circumstances might you be able to do, do this to actually, actually do payments. And, and anyway, but forget that. Um, your, your question is obviously very relevant, uh, incentives. I think it's a, it's, it's a slightly unclear point to me, but I'm hoping that it's one of those situations where the market figures it out for you. So essentially, you've got a degree of freedom in um, the proposal that you make. So in your nice presentation, you clearly showed like what the, the, the transaction looks like. You have uh, two inputs, one from each party, and you have two equal sized outputs and then one change output for the, for the receiving party. Now, even in that simplest model, well, that's the model that exists in the proposal, it obviously is possible to to tweak uh, like who is paying the Bitcoin transaction fee in that and who, and maybe further, so one party might actually receive additional funds um, depending on some details. One party might, it might be the proposer and it might be the receiver and I can see arguments for both. Um, 
the most natural uh, my suspicion is that this would start off with a kind of proposers making proposals which receivers do receive money from um but it could easily be imagined as going the other way only because proposers have more work to do than receivers um and then thirdly as i was just mentioning at the start there uh, we could imagine a slightly different model of snicker where somebody wants to spend money in a coin join and actually force a receiver to uh take a specific sized output that would require four outputs instead of three now that's not actually in included in the bit but it's just something i was thinking about as a future possible improvement and, and the reason that I, I find that fascinating because i could imagine this scenario where like imagine you wanted to you wanted to pay someone one btc and or you uh wanted to do it with slightly you know better privacy but you were willing to sort of wait a little while but if you sweeten the pot significantly you might find that you know putting out 100 proposals you immediately get one of them snapped up and all the receivers are in a race to get that to get that money so it could actually create a very bizarrely like fast process even though it's totally non-interactive <laughs> Yeah, you know, Adam, kind of jumping upon this point, uh, what if we add one round of uh, of interact? So uh, Alice proposes a Snicker transaction that then Bob downloads and decrypts and sees, but Bob actually wants to do an equal value or like a different equal value to pay one specific amount, and then Bob creates the second proposal adjusted to his needs. Uh, and decrypts this to Alice's puppy and publishes back to the bulletin board, <laughs> where then Alice downloads it. That's interesting. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it, it's, it's almost it's almost the case that you you can't stop him, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't actually think that there's exactly it's almost it's, not it's almost not needed to, to 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 change any anything in the proposal for that to happen, right? No, no, it would just be client side, a second yeah. sticker proposal, but to already two peers who have already established some form of communication beforehand. I suppose what that, that suggestion, that's a very interesting suggestion. I suppose what it throws up is the a point which isn't really clear, which is to what extent sh are these roles separate, separated, the proposer and the receiver, and to what extent should they be separated? Now, I, I originally had in mind um, a quite asymmetric scenario because I felt, and I, I think I'm, I, I think this is true really, that the proposer, because of needing um, a significant amount of sort of blockchain scanning skills m and uh, access to the ability to scan blockchain to, to find candidates. Uh, the proposer's job is a, is you know significantly more difficult than the receiver, and I was I was specifically trying to advertise the idea that the receiver side of this protocol is something that could be implemented in mobile wallets pretty easily. But I think if you try to make the two parties um, symmetrical in their abilities, and you say that any Snicker enabled wallet is able to do both sides, that would be cool. But I am afraid that it imposes slightly larger uh computation and, and etc costs and you know development costs on on let's say a mobile wallet that wanted to implement the proposal so i'm i'm quite keen to defend the idea that people could be receiver only and it could be nice and simple but that doesn't of course set aside the possibility that like the souped up professional grade wallet um is able to do both sides and is able to do what you just said, which is that they could be even because they're constantly listening for proposals. Like they ping out a proposal and they get get more, get one back on the same UTXO. That's that's really kind of clever. I like that. Thank you. All right, my All right, question. My question. Sneaker. Sneaker. Simple mm -hmm. interactive coin join with keys for encryption reused. Mm -hmm. Explain it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the S. Uh, well, it's funny when I was in uh, what was it Amsterdam, and I, I was explaining this to to, to roast beef, and he he said that's a backronym, isn't it? And he, I said you're, you're absolutely right. It's a very backronym. Um, you know, back, you know what backronym means? No, backronym. No. Okay, backronym is just like you know, acronym is the word in English that refers to the case where you give the initials of something like PSBT is an ac acronym starting with A. So there's this kind of joke word backronym, which is where you you think up the the name and then you choose the words to make it fit that acronym. <laughs> so so basically, uh, I was trying to find a, a memorable word for um, non in. Well, the the origin of this was in thinking about the idea of non interactive coin join generally. That, that there have been various. Um, 
ideas proposed in the past and none of them quite really worked for making coin join non-interactive um so the s is just to make it work it's just the backronym snicker simple but the keys for encryption reused i think does actually make sense right because you i mean maybe if it wasn't a backronym it would have been keys reused for encryption <laughs> but um but it does make sense right because you either take uh, a reused address so you have a, a key a public key there that you're reusing for encryption or you, you're taking a key from a previous transaction and reusing it for encryption. By the way, this brings up a point that is sometimes discussed in this in this protocol is, you know, to what extent is the encryption part necessary? I personally think it is either completely necessary or it's very, very desirable. Uh, but it's a kind of an interesting thought experiment to imagine how all this would work if the PSBTs or the anyway the the signatures on transactions were just broadcast onto the message board in the clear. It's I think it's not really desirable. So I think the encryption part, although it's sort of a little bit extra compli- complexity, it's it's it's, it's kind of necessary. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. Questions for the author, or should we get on general questions? Okay, general question. No, I have a question. Sorry, um, because uh, uh, well, before that, thanks, Adam, for joining us. Um, my question is: for example, we have this uh, machine, the the Wasabi Coin Join uh, machine, that knows the inputs, right, and the mm-hmm. change address for 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 every single participant and if you if you were um, working with wasabi and you know that and you mm. have this this thing mm. um, what what could you do for example could you um, create a proposal for every change output or or what can how can we take advantage of this that we already have here hmm. uh, to to implement sneaker easier or more uh, effective i don't know sure sure i don't know i'm i'm kind of hoping that you're you're going to explain this to me a bit more because i remember that the reason i wrote the draft bit was because you had a thread on your github and I thought, oh, people are interested in um, in the idea of doing this, and I wanted to make sure that there was some kind of clear, uh, clearly defined protocol written somewhere, so that if people like you want to discuss it, you you at least have something concrete to discuss. Um, now, how would the Wasabi scenario? Uh, how would it change this? Um, I don't actually know for sure. Uh, in in the naive sense, okay, when we have a Wasabi coin join, we have a large transaction with a lot of outputs. We could try to propose, uh, I don't know who we is in the sentence, but we could try to propose um, uh, snicker coin joins on the change outputs. Uh, But to do that, we would need to uh, use the version one of snicker. In other words, because there's no address reuse, we would need a, a public key to work with. So I don't know whether you're going to make proposals on input keys from deposit does that make sense uh, you, do, you don't have the x pubs do you or something this is great because inputs are, are 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 usually quite linkable to change um not it's not always 100 percent clear but in in most cases you can quickly find- uh, yeah 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 that's true but that's not actually addressing the point is it if you think about it because the what you remember in version one the point is you have to find the uh what am i trying to say you've got the you need you need, you need a public oh, yeah 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 you're right yeah that's that's all you need yeah 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 it, because it's a big coin join and you can generally link inputs to outputs that addresses the problem yeah you're right you know, and another cool thing with the wasabi architecture that is that the participants of the coin join right mm. receive both the coin join transaction as well as the blog very swiftly so they could, the, those peers that actually communicate in the zero link coin join itself could then do a snicker coin join very, very quickly afterwards mm. to get the property also for their, um, for, for their change outputs, maybe even within the same block. 
Yeah, but I mean, um, but well, first of all, yes, I agree with everything everyone said. Um, I was never really clear though uh, why you find this this interesting specifically in a wasabi sense. I think it's just generally interesting for everyone somewhat <laughs> but I, I thought the really obvious like um best use case for this was like a, a a mobile wallet that wanted some extra privacy feature but didn't want to have to implement a massive you know a big coordinated uh, over a network and to a server or not to a server but whatever you know, they, they didn't want something too complicated but they just wanted something that very passively over a long period would add more coin joins isn't it the case with something like wasabi that you have you have the guys the, the guys there right he's connected up to the server and he's done his 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 mixing and he's got his and on sets and what have you and if he's got change outputs that he's not happy with he can just put it through another round of mixing can't he or, or, or what yes yes you you are absolutely right uh, we are trying to 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 do research alternatives to mm -hmm. uh, provide new new uh, privacy features mm. and the receiver is more or less clear to me how to do it and it's, mm. it's easy to do in a mobile in a mobile uh, wallet yes yeah but yeah. the proposer um, has to do more job and yeah. we can do that I mm -hmm. mean I think mm -hmm. we can provide because I, I think uh, for example uh, the electrum electrum team was saying that well they maybe could implement the the receiver part and i think yeah. m many people can do that because it's yeah. it is probably easier so we can we can do the proposer i think and mm. that will be great because you need a proposer <laughs> someone has yeah. to do it yeah so that that's why and this doesn't have to 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 uh, generate revenue for us it's mm. just we want to be the, the best wallet just that right i see what you mean yeah so if you when you say we can be the proposer are you saying would it be something like the the client like they've got a desktop wallet uh, desktop wasabi wallet are they going to be effectively making like requests to to wasabi servers to scan oh no they have their own bitcoin core they might have their own bitcoin core right how would they how would they get these scanning results to find proposals? How how would that work? I mean, either it's Bitcoin Core running, or you you use the blocks that you already have downloaded, because we have um, both. No, he's asking uh, he's asking where the proposals would come from, and I'm guessing the answer is uh, either from the coordinator or in Wasabi. There would be like it would point to a public, you know. Uh, repository or, or where these proposals are being uh, maintained. I guess the client just needs um, a list of candidates. The, the difficult, the, the thing that's kind of somewhat intensive is to get candidate UTXOs, isn't it? Because once you've got a candidate UTXO, you could act as proposer and construct a proposal pretty easily on it's, it's not really more complicated than the receiver, is it? Yeah, I think so. And then you just you just encrypt it and, and you just put it wherever the bulletin. It could, Wasabi could also maintain a bulletin board. That would be nice and easy for you. Because it's just going to be a bunch of you know bl binary blobs. So it's, you know. So hypothetically, Wasabi could be Snicker compliant and then uh, uh, not deal with the proposals at all, but just tell everyone it's Snicker compliant and then maybe have a place where people can post uh, their proposals and people should just know you should you should only target utxos from you know recent wasabi coin joins in particular the change outputs um, that would make it easier for proposers hmm. yeah you could restrict it like that that would that would that would certainly make things a bit easier to handle yeah can can you talk about uh top root Oh yeah, yeah. Thanks for reminding me. I forgot about that. It's just one small detail, but it's very simple and and elegant. Which is that uh, if we, you know, obviously uh, these things take time, don't they? But if everyone switched to Taproot, then there would be no discussion about version zero and version one. Uh, there would just be a version two for Taproot, which is because the Taproot exposes the public key directly in the UTXO. Then there would be no need to make an inference or to worry about reused addresses. I actually forgot that, and David Harding told me after I after I'd written the the thing. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh -huh. um, here, here, Adam, a uh, quick, quick question. What if, I mean, the temporal pop key is a tweak pop key, right? Yeah, yeah, so but it doesn't matter. It's, it's then just a twice peak tweaked pop key. Yeah, I mean, it's only, it's kind of abstract, isn't it? But if you think about it, like the taproot public key is, you know, notionally tweaked with the script, but, but if you're just creating just vanilla taproot segwit version one outputs, you're just, that, that's irrelevant because you're just going to know the private key anyway. So, I mean, yeah, you, you're right in theory that if you, no, but it's actually, you make a fair point because, because if I go in as a proposer and look on the blockchain and I find all the taproot outputs, uh, I never know which ones are actually like tweaks with an actual script and which ones are just like a, a public key and, and there's no script behind it, no Merkle root, you know. Um, but you're right. So in some like abstract sense, it's like a tweak of a tweak, but that doesn't change anything. Right, you just take the two tweaking factors to the original private key, and it, you know, but it, yeah, but you think about it, it doesn't. It's not never really going to work like that in practice, is it? Because if if it's an ordinary taproot output, and it's not like some weird multisig, in which case this is never going to work, or, or I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> then you're 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 just going to be the person who owns it is just going to be signing on the full key, just like they do usually, you know. Because usually, even in multisig taproot, you're you're signing on the main key. The the uh, the key pass spending because you you just override the contract you know uh, I'm I'm waffling now ignore me <laughs> anyway there's, there's no there's no issue there's no issue it's fine yes that that that's great I uh, I didn't have that in mind you know if 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 we implement that route too uh, mm -hmm. all the outputs of the, our conjoint transactions could be uh, candidates for okay. for for sneakers because yeah. it, it is clear it's people that wants to to gain privacy so it's some it's they are natural candidates mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting that you, you you look at it like this that you think of it more in terms of like we could be proposers because uh i think the the sales pitch I've, I've tried to like get people to see this is that the sales pitch of this is the, the ability to have coin joins without doing anything at all um that's how I tried to sell it to people. I don't think the, 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 let's not forget in all this discussion, you know, the, the huge weakness of the idea is the um, it's just two party coin joints. Right. Uh, and so you, you, you've, you've got to be looking at it in a certain way. Like, and I think it's in a way it's almost the opposite of wasabi. Uh, I was on a podcast a few weeks back and I said, this is what I said. It's like, think of it as like a spectrum. Wasabi is really on one end and this is on the other end. Because Wasabi is very tightly coordinated, very tightly coupled, like everyone gets together and it's got advanced cryptography to make sure the privacy still works, but it is tightly coupled. And it means that, you know, if, as long as people are willing to get together and do it, it works right. Whereas this is exactly the opposite. This is like the ultimate laziness of CoinJoin. It's like, <laughs> I really don't give a shit. I'm just running a wallet and on my phone and I switch it on every day or two. Because that, that's the thing, right? This system could work even if you don't switch your wallet on very often. Because it could just, when you switch it on, it could download the, the latest proposals for your key. Oh, by the way, we didn't mention that. Indexing keys. Um, okay, I'll stop waffling. But I think we, there, there is a whole area which we haven't discussed, which is like this whole issue of how do you deal with a huge number of proposals. Uh, I, I want to get into that. And more yeah, specifically maybe, maybe. the spam issue. Yeah, let's talk about that. And, yeah. and I will have a surprise uh, idea for you that uh, that brings together top root and and uh, spam issue. So, can you talk about? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, go go ahead. Adam. No, no. I want I want you to talk. I, I, I please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> so you had a couple of ideas how to how to prevent uh, prevent the spam issue, and I'm most interested in the hash cash one. That's why we right. should first discuss the non-hash cash funds. So first, someone could pay some money to, I don't know, burn or central coordinator or, or something like that. But mm -hmm. probably burn in order to make a proposal. So mm -hmm. how would you do that? How would you? Yeah, it would have to be a central. Like the, so in that scenario, um, you've got, 
I'm what well, Lisa, this is what was in my head. You've got a bulletin board server. And I, I was I was planning to do this, but I, I've just never got around to it. I just to set it up as a, as a as a kind of a proof of concept. Just set up a tall hidden service, and all it does is receives encrypted blobs as proposals, and then anyone, let's say with a join market wallet, it, it's some code in there that just pings that URL, that that tall hidden service URL and just downloads anything that connected to a particular key. So you'd index it by public key just because it's a little bit easier. Uh, so the proposal would attach in in public the public key for that proposal, which is not a privacy loss because that's on the blockchain anyway, and it's only a proposal. It's not the receiver doing it. So the receiver would just take all of it and just maybe for maximal privacy and then just um, read the proposals for his public key. Uh, in that scenario, we know there will be a particular hidden service and they could just say well look you can't make a a proposal unless you let's so if it's a payment to a burn address they could say to make a thousand proposals you have to or or you get one thousand proposals per i don't know one unit of of bitcoin sent to the burn address and you have to sign the the key it'd be a bit of a mess and more to the point it would be a kind of cent, extra centralization factor but it would be one way to prevent the obvious problem that if you send encrypted proposals, there could be a billion of them and nobody has any idea whether they're, they're valid or not. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm confused why this is a problem be because uh, uh, firstly, the encrypted blobs have the corresponding public key. So most people don't have to look through uh, blobs that don't r relate to them, but also, um, why doesn't the hash cache solution of just forcing encrypted blobs to have a, a, a unique hash work? Well, I think Napara is going to come on to that, yeah. So the rest of the ideas, except with the exception of the hash cache, is all about paying <coughs> some money. The fidelity bonds, the paying with Lightning Network, those are all about paying with I money, right? Well, the, the lightning would be paying, but let's be clear about fidelity bonds, right? It's not quite the same because you don't actually pay the money. You just lock it, right? So you lock the money and you, you sign for it and, you know, it's provably locked for some period of time. So you lose the time value of the money, but you don't actually lose the money. Um, so it's fiddly and that would be even probably even more complicated than a, just a payment, right? Well, it would be more complicated, Um it will be inconvenient for user for proposers to have to lock up their money but and also then you have to worry about the privacy implications this is one of the problems i have with all these proposals is when we're trying to create a very privacy system we're not exposing like network information and trying to get better privacy for our coins but if we then have to make pay with our coins well, we have to start worrying about the privacy of those payments and it's like almost infinite regress because like now i'm gonna have to coin join my my fidelity bonds and my and my payments as well as the coin join that i'm actually coin joining and oh god what a mess uh don't really like any of those proposals but i don't think they're necessarily wrong they, they, they could work i mean after all lightning has some privacy so mm. awesome so, awesome. so yeah. let's go on to the last one or the first one from mm -hmm. whichever point you go hash cash the idea of hash cache uh, mm. is that you make some computation and you prove that you made that computation in order to make an action. So it would not be like, uh, well, an attacker would have to get a lot of resources or, 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 or bots or something like that in order to, to attack, mm -hmm. to DOS attack this system. and. And whenever they stop the attack, the system is back online. So, so that's the idea of hash cache, which is as you you phrased it, you paraphrased it in bit message or in other systems. It's sort of kind of worked, right? Yeah. Do you want to say anything to it or? No, I just think it's an interesting idea, but I'm I'm just mystical about whether whether it could be effective for. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm just not sure, to be honest. Sorry, I'm. I just realized it probably wouldn't be effective because the proposer has to issue so many of these proposals. So well, if, if you toggle, if you if you toggle it so that every proposal costs, you know, five seconds of computation, then it's it's uh, it's probably going to hurt people who are legitimate. 
<laughs> yeah, it is. It is, but but think of it this way, right? In the original proposal of Hashcash for for junk mail, the scenario there is that um, the attacker wants to make a yeah. So in that case, the attacker probably wants to send tens of thousands of emails and maybe has a one percent or a point one percent conversion rate. So it's quite heavily skewed in favor of the honest participant because. Uh, an honest email user doesn't need to send thousands of emails, maybe just a few, right? So that's why Hashcash made sense. Now, here we've got a kind of gray area that I don't really know the truth of. Like, what is the ratio? Like, if you're an attacker, first of all, why are you even attacking the system? There's no monetary incentive in attacking it. So it must be like a kind of a somebody wants to kill the system, right? So since we, we can't really measure their economic incentive, I mean, how... Um, uh, how much? What, what's the scaling factor that we need to create to make it to make it uh, f feasible for the honest user, but infeasible for the attacker? And also, part of that equation is that how many proposals do you need to make as a proposer? Do you need to make tens of thousands? Do you need to make hundred? Do you need to make ten? I have no idea. It's really it's really how, all up how, in the air. Go how on. about this? Um, when you so you know a, a proposer will mo most likely do several proposals especially mm. when the coins that he proposes for are being spent, right? Because, uh, and then what might be possible is that the, if there, if these proposals are encrypted, that the proposer can prove that the encrypted blob was from a now spent output. And if he can provide the proof that this mm. encrypted message is no longer needed, then he has the right to add a new encrypted block, or maybe even two of them, uh, to kind of propose the next two things. And as soon I as thought, these mm. proposals become obsolete, you can upload the next one. Yeah, I thought about this, and also I remember maybe it was Matt Corallo or somebody who thought about this and, and suggesting like zero knowledge proofs of certain properties of the encrypted data. Um, I don't actually think it works at all. And I, the reason I say that is because fundamentally you can't know if an, a proposal is is valid unless you have like full consensus access to Bitcoin. Because if, if I'm an attacker and all I want to do is create a, a fake proposal, then it may be even as simple as just like tweaking one tiny, uh, uh, like one byte in the UTXO input string, you know, the, the, the like the 32 byte UTXO input. And I don't think that there's a way that zero knowledge proofs can actually address that i mean let's i'm completely, completely putting aside the problem that you've got of, of sha2 proving proving uh properties of of data under sha2 is already very complicated but even that wouldn't be enough you 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 need i don't know i think it doesn't work that's what i'm saying i i, I have an, uh, an idea because there can be more than just one bulletin board so mm -hmm. we, for example, in Wasabi, in our coordinator, we can we, we could have one and search for um, candidates. Yes, for mm -hmm. example, with that because it's simpler and post proposals to our own bulletin board mm -hmm. where nobody else have access to to write. Mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, to, to post proposals, so uh, in that in that case, uh, we don't need any any me mechanism for spam protection or anything like that because we are the only ones that post proposals there. Uh, well, a uh, uh, mobile wallet can can query our our bulletin board, for example, uh, and, and others too. So I think in in our case we. We could do something like that it could be very simple yeah i think that's one of the first of like i, I listed four or five ways you could try and handle this one way is you could just restrict access fundamentally just there's a fixed set of people who could make proposals but obviously that's that's a less interesting proposal at scale because we we, we want proposals from you know various parties we don't really want uh, well yes but uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. But, you know, we can have, for example, our own bulletin board and other people can have all, all uh, another one. And there can be just one that synchronizes, uh, uh, that um, consolidates all the, the proposals in one big uh, or main or central uh, repository. Uh, it could be. Uh, I don't know. I mean, how yeah. to scale that is... is, is I think probably I 
I don't know, really. Probably it's a different problem. Probably it is not. <laughs> but it, it could work. Yeah, I think it can definitely work. It's just a question of how, how far we can go in, in making it as, as kind of as, as effective and, and broad as possible. Mm. Okay, guys, here you go. Pay to end point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what's, what's the largest problem of pay to end point? Or <laughs> rather, what do I think is the largest problem of pay to end point? Is that it disrupts the existing user workflow. Mm. What okay. can we do about it? What do we want? We want someone to give me an address and then I could even send money to that address or based on that address, I could establish a peer to peer encrypted communication between the someone who is giving me the address. Right. Mm. If we could solve mm. this, that would be great. Mm. Uh, one, one comment just about that. You know, um, uh, Tor provides what is called something like uh, ephemeral hidden services or something like that, that can be created uh, on the fly. I mean, without a, a, a Tor config file. Um, so you can open, for example, uh, Wasabi and create and, and publish an endpoint as a uh, uh, hidden services, as a hidden service without any configuration file or anything like that. So um, you just need to um, to know the the onion address of the of your peer. And that's all. That, that's important. Uh, but there is a more mm -hmm. fundamental issue here. And it turns out it's the exact same issue that uh, Snicker has. Is that how do you send an encrypted message to someone based on only the Bitcoin address, right? You can't do that. You can't get the public key out of the Bitcoin address unless it's a top root output. Mm. So yeah. now you can create an encrypted message from the Bitcoin mm. address that someone sent to you and that message would include your Tor endpoint and then yeah. you could broadcast that to a peer-to-peer -peer network and they would get in communication with you. So the problem is solved. What's the only problem left is the spam attack. And how could we, I wouldn't dare to say solve the spam attack, but definitely improve a lot on it with Hashcash. That's a straightforward application to that. So what do you think about that? So, you, so you're basically saying BitMessage was the answer all along. <laughs> we basically need a peer-to-peer -peer messaging network that's encrypted and has Hashcash. So uh, yeah. we should have stuck with BitMessage. We should have stuck with BitMessage. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the problem was that uh, you cannot, you don't want to ruin the user workflow, right? It wouldn't ruin anything because someone would give you an address and if, if, the, if there is no answer to, to your encrypted message, then you just send the money. So the user right, would not but, yeah. notice anything that, hey, uh, pay to endpoint transaction happened. The user would have no idea about that. It just give you an address and send you a transaction, and you know. But wait, are you saying that, as far as you're concerned, this problem is solved by Hashcash? Is that what you're saying? The encrypting message problem is solved by Taproot, and this yes. one issue. I wouldn't dare to say solve, but, uh, <laughs> but definitely improved with hash Hashcash, or at least a try, it worth a try, you know? But I think I, mm, but I think the reason that Hashcash made sense with BitMessage was because BitMessage was like email, where what, all you were trying to do was prevent... Um, yeah, no, it's almost the same, but it's not quite the same somehow. All you were trying to do is prevent many messages, many fake messages to go out to the network. Yeah, but... Uh, hmm. 
yeah but <laughs> not sure if it works that way right because there are millions of other ways an attacker can figure out to get that much computation for that you would mm. ask what's the what's what's good in it for the attacker and nothing mm. really because the transaction is still happening but without mm. pay mm. point yes i think that's a, actually quite a strong argument and um, there is a limited time frame that well if if there is a if if you don't find if if no one replies to your encrypted message within 10 seconds maybe mm. that's how long a user can tolerate or maybe that's that's too much already but if you don't find an encrypted if you don't find a communication then you just send a normal message i think for payments where people can't tolerate a 10 second wait and then then they should they should be using lightning anyway it would be a smaller payment generally a retail payment anyway i i threw mm. this idea out there uh, we can we can move on to snicker more specifically no i think we've we've covered a lot of a lot of it yeah. uh, one one thing that i was so curious is about how to best and privately retrieve proposals uh from a receiver Hmm. And um, I thought because we, or maybe there are already the public keys exposed, right, together with the encrypted data. So I thought um, it, it would go on rice filters, similar to block filters, uh, Bit 158. Would that make sense here? I'm, if, if you're asking me, I'm actually not, I haven't really studied that area yet, but it, in, intuitively from like a vague idea of, of what it's doing, it, it should be, the same problem so I, su I suspect a similar solution will apply yes i mean obviously the naive thing to do is to, is to download everything that way it's like it's like running a bitcoin core node where you just download everything and obviously the equally naive in the other direction is just to only take the data for your public key which would reveal something about you even though you know tor blah 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 but it would reveal something so yeah the kind of probably the smart way is to have some kind of filter that would intelligently download data in such a way that people couldn't because it would be a bit like bitcoin blocks right because you'd if imagine you had a, a mobile phone wallet you turn it on it let's say you turn it on every morning for whatever reason you probably don't <laughs> let's say you do um then you'd want to download the data since the previous time you logged on which would be a chunk of uh, encrypted proposals and and like you say we we, we probably would want some kind of filter to, to be smart about it yeah so I only have two more topics left. Uh, one is, is just a statement that I think it's uncontroversial, but uh, but I will ask. So I think the most uh, efficient way working on Snicker should be actually after Taproot gets on the Bitcoin network. So before that, it's kind of a hack, but after Taproot gets there, it's a, it's a more cleaner solution. Anyone has anything to add to that? Okay, the next thing is this this is kind of uh, silly too because I know the answer but I, I just want to want to ask it that uh, you know Schnorr signature aggregation which results in 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 aggregating the signatures is a notoriously interactive process while mm. uh, Snicker is an notoriously non-interactive process. So can you, <laughs> <laughs> can you uh, elaborate on that? Well, yeah, but the, if it, well, the thing about Schnorr's signature aggregation is, is there's different, like, um, what's the word, different uh, scenarios where you use it, right? If we're talking about multi-sig, then we're talking about music, and that is a three-round interactive protocol as as currently uh set up um but that wouldn't i mean that doesn't really apply to this because this is this is like coin join between different parties but if we were talking about signature aggregation cross inputs then as far as i know there's there isn't even a proposal for that yet if i remember right so so i'm not sure what i could say about it but i i, I if I suppose we could imagine a future where that was happening and where therefore there would be a problem in doing this kind of protocol because 
the signature but the thing is if the signature aggregation cross inputs requires interactivity that would that that statement only really applies when more than one input is whether when the inputs are not yes, all owned by exactly. the same party so it only applies to coin join um and so it might mean that you couldn't make a snicker coin join that like other coin joins had the nice property of reducing the size of the transaction and therefore being more economical so it might make snicker a lot less uh, attractive I, I guess that's what you had in mind is it Yes but, yes, but on the other hand, if you actually assume uh, interactivity, then you can assume that every wallet will implement the the signature aggregation. Mm -hmm. And if Snicker wouldn't implement it, then it would just mean uh, that's a Snicker transaction because that's... Yeah, 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 yeah. It would, it would mark it out as just different, yeah, but... Yeah, but it doesn't matter I because, as you said, it, it, it applies if... So if, if you pass around the transaction between mm. participants, it, 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 it's not a problem. It's a problem when you just want to pass back the signature to the server. No, because you have mm. to pass around the signature. But mm. to participants mm. is not a problem. Anyway, mm. th that, that was for me all. And uh, go ahead, guys. Anyone has anything to uh, ask, discuss? I guess I'll say something maybe uh, controversial or non-controversial. Uh, I don't see Snicker being useful outside of the uh, the mobile devices, like what uh, Adam was saying. Um, um, I'm trying to rack my head around different w w use cases, but uh, feels like it's really for the mobile devices. Mm. I mean, maybe the only I, I I tend to agree, but maybe the counter argument might be especially if um wasabi users because i'm thinking about wasabi specifically because because of where, where we are um maybe if wasabi users saw a value in having this is kind of opposite to what lucas was saying because i almost think like the wasabi users what might want to do it between themselves and not involve the wasabi server at all uh because i think the wasabi model is pretty strong but the, there is a theoretical weakness of you know the server maybe sort of sibling and stuff like that um maybe that's a bit silly i don't know but but i just think maybe you could imagine wasabi because of wasabi coin join like a joy market coin join has the property of being a very sick like certain things have happened you, you might find it useful to sort of do extra coin joins pulling off the edge or then that, maybe that's not a good example <laughs> There's also something about uh, small coin joins that's very unappealing, which is that they're very inefficient. Um, right, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, per, per byte, per byte, it's always better to have as many people as possible. Um, so yeah, yeah it, it's sometimes easy to forget that in in 2020 or whatever, because <laughs> fees are so cheap nowadays. But uh, only a couple of ago, it was just a bit of a nightmare doing coin joins. <laughs> It's a good point. Well, you know, it, 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 as, as I would agree that Wasabi is probably a bit too heavy software to do the uh, receiving of these. Um, as Lucas said earlier, it might really be a good opportunity for Wasabi Coin to be able to uh, propose Snickers transactions and then that then other wallets like mobile wallets can do these rounds uh, based on Wasabi users proposing them. Uh, so so that might actually be quite interesting uh, uh, yeah, that, that Wasabi have... actually contributes to proposing. Yeah, you have a selling point there, don't you? Because if I, as a receiver, get a proposal from a, a Wasabi output, then I can inherit partially um, some of the anonymity set. Some of it. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a great point that I didn't think about here. Yeah. It'll depend on the details, but it, it, it could be a, a, a thing. All right, any more topics for someone? Or we should move on to the to deciding what should be the next the next topic, uh, next week's topic. So yeah, go ahead if, maybe, if you have something. Maybe Adam, uh, specifically for how do you want to do this with Join Market? Do you have any implementation ideas specifically? 
Oh yeah. So um, well, it's a bit uh, it's a bit stuck because I I wrote a PR for it for just only the receiver side um, about I don't know three four months ago, uh, but a bunch of other stuff got in the way, and then I realised that I didn't really have a good PSBT library yet um, that I could use. Uh, but that was just me. What, what I really wanted to do was I wanted to write the receiver side into the um, into the join market software and then set up a test uh, server uh, for a bulletin board. Um, and then obviously it have to, would have to make proposals, but it would just be like me or like one or two people making proposals initially just to try it out, you know, because, because I'm more interested in just like having it get, getting it tried out um, at this point after, after having at least a proposal is written now. So it's, there's some kind of like standardized format for it. The, the, once that's decided, then the, the, I, I was hoping there would be a proof of concept, but I, I, I haven't really <laughs> haven't really finished. <laughs> so you know, you know how it goes. <laughs> All right. Anyone has anything left on sneaker? Uh, no, no. Just my opinion is, you know, uh, uh, Max, for example, is a big fan of atomic swaps, and I think, for example, that sneakers is it is probably easier for for us, and it, it is it mm. it could be good if we can uh, do something because we have this wallet that we have a server we can find um, uh, candidates on our server. Yes, and, and we can uh, have do the the, the the hard work. Um, uh, I disagree. So, okay, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> it's just another uh, another opinion. I, I think it, it it could be it could be possible. We, I mean, we we have the infrastructure too. We can have our bulletin board. Uh, uh, I like it. <laughs> Just that. I I believe there are other alternatives that could could be more more easier or more flexible to implement. Uh, just uh, being a coin join taker in every transaction, uh, pay to endpoint. So you would implement Tor communication between between people. And that would help a lot in 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 in, in salaries, giving out salaries too, because <laughs> it's like it's like, could you give me an address? Yes, it is the address. Yes, it, <laughs> you know, whatever. So, but but anyway, uh, my my point is that uh, the very first issue that what Aviv said is that two of two coin joins are really inefficient. So mm, that's good point. Why I yeah. Don't don't uh, think mm -hmm. okay so ideas for next week i'm gonna politely ask uh, recommend something uh which is the uh, uh, uh i think it's coin shuffle or cash shuffle um the reason why i'm so motivated to to, to learn and read about that is because apparently um, Bitcoin.com, Bitcoin Cash Wallet is going to implement it for their mobile devices. And uh, so it's already in production or, or, or very close to production. So I'd really like to investigate that. I've read the Coin Shuffle and, Cash, uh, and Coin Shuffle Plus Plus papers. And they are very. So, uh, uh, I don't disagree. I, I just want to say that if we go with with cash shuffle then let's just start with cash shuffle paper not cash shuffle plus plus not value shuffle what ah sorry sorry <laughs> coin shuffle I, I, i'm talking about coin shuffle so let's start with the coin shuffle paper and then go one by one on on, on the things uh oh, okay so coin shuffle one idea another idea Okay, I, I have a couple. Uh, 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 you, you know, for me, coin shuffle is, is also something that we have to take a look. I, I read the coin shuffle and coin shuffle plus plus uh, papers. Um, I, I are very interesting, but the, the problem is, I think 
we will never implement something like that. So uh, I don't know if it. Yes, it, it is good to know more, but I don't know if if we will gain some. I mean, by, I, I have the same that. opinion on on sneaker that uh, I think we will never implement it, but. Uh, it just brought me two insights about Taproot and Hashcash that I, I I value a lot, uh, you know. And we did not really start to work on the new mixing. We just trying to learn more because there is a lot to learn, you know. So yes, okay. Uh, then I have ideas. I have a couple of things. Uh, I just I just say it then. One is coin join. Sudoku, which is which is analyzing coin join transactions. Uh, it, it was actually analyzing blockchain info transactions. Uh, that's that's interesting. Another one is Bolt Boltzmann from uh, you guys might uh, know Boltzmann uh, from from Laurent mm -hmm. uh, at Samurai. That I think that's uh, that's an interesting thing to take a look at. Another thing is Knapsack code because the guy just gave us a code base that uh, would be really interesting to look into. Another thing is, uh, yes, Cash Fusion. Cash Fusion oh, yeah. published a paper. Uh, not not the whole Cash Fusion. I don't propose that. That's 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 a lot. But published a paper about analyzing cash fusion transactions it, it, it's not a paper it's a blog post and i think that would be really interesting in in light of that we know now how knapsack was analyzing the the transactions how the knapsack paper was analyzing the transactions so i think that blog post would be really interesting so let's do the vote who is voting for coin shuffle Okay, I'm voting for coin shuffle. Yeah, me too. Okay, coin yeah, shuffle two, me too. three. Me too. Four. Uh, wait, uh, just one, one, one more point. Sorry, <laughs> four. Um, next time, instead of coin shuffle plus plus, for example, we can um, go directly to uh, the dining cryptographers. Uh, problem and the the DC networks uh, mm. instead of jumping directly to the to the coin shuffle plus plus because it's it's not so easy to to catch uh, the first. <laughs> I, I I will add it. Uh, okay, so we have four votes to coin shuffle and di dining cryptographer DC nets dining DC nets, cryptographer yeah. networks. Uh, who is voting for that? I, I, I vote one. Who has? Lucas, of course. Uh, no, but not for the next one. The next one only coin shuffle. Probably the. Oh, you the mean from coin shuffle to coin shuffle plus plus we should. Yes, exactly. Ah, okay. Oh, all right. So, coin join Sudoku. I vote one. You can vote for multiple things, by the way. Sorry. I'm okay with that as well. The Sudoku. Okay. Uh, Boltzmann, I vote one. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, would be cool. Three. Yes, I, I vote for that too. Four. Knapsack code, I vote one. And the last. And the last one is the cash fusion analysis, uh, amount analysis. It's very similar to the NAPSAC, what we did last week. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear it. Can you repeat it, Max? Yes, I will do that too. You're voting to this? Okay, that's two votes looks like no one else is voting so we have coin shuffle and boltzmann 
with four bolts. How should we decide on that? Whoever with a coin. <laughs> Vote on the blockchain. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, yeah. You okay. Vote, so Adam, uh, Adam, Adam, why don't, Adam, you, you, uh, why don't you break the tie, Adam? <laughs> well, is it me? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's just a huge amount of stuff, you know? Uh, no, I, I don't really know. I'll, I'll let you, you figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So... Okay, let's do this. How about we do the coin shuffle? But that means for the next five weeks we are full because coin shuffle, DC net, coin shuffle plus plus, value shuffle, cash shuffle, cash fusion. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Oh well, I, I I I have more. If if Adam one day can help us again. It could be great to 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 have a something about betters and commitments, ring signatures, <laughs> confidential transactions. Adam, Adam actually That's wrote. Uh, great. Yes. Adam don't don't wrote forget a, don't forget to, to to do coin shuffle plus plus. You also need to learn how to factorize polynomials over finite fields. So that'll be a nice <laughs> a nice short session as well. <laughs> you know. <laughs> A weekly uh, club, like a daily, twice daily, probably. <laughs> let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> All right, guys. Coin shuffle next week. Anyone has anything Excellent. Like that they want to say, talk about? Uh, what did you think about this, this episode? Adam, how you liked it? Oh, sorry. You're asking me? Uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was great. Um, yeah, that was I, I was very useful actually. Mm. I like the presentation. All right, thank you guys, uh, and see you next week. I hope uh, we have an attendance like this. I will ask Tim Ruffing if he can come. Oh, and the other people. Yep. Thank you very much, Adam, for joining us. It was very very helpful and insightful. Give it thank up. you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you guys, and don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs> 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 and